We uh, look at a passage here that has uh, a lot to do with Palm Sunday, and uh, as we were looking, or as I was looking, you weren't looking, as I was looking at the uh, Palm Sunday passage, I thought, okay, we're in 1 Samuel, is there anything in the Samuel uh, body of, of uh, uh, God's words that uh, speaks to Palm Sunday? And so here we are at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, um, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word, eternally true. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. Then David, took, David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us there in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Um, I have many talents. No, I have many things uh, that I don't have talents for. I have many things I wish I had talents for. Um, there, I got to my first sentence. <laughs> and one of those things is playing piano. I wish I was a great piano player, but my problem was in playing piano when I was taking lessons, and I still don't know today whether it's third through fifth grade. It seemed like that. It may have just been fourth and fifth grade. Um, I, I remember thinking always during that time that one day I would sit down at the piano and it would just flow. And I was a kid in the 70s, and so if you were a person in the 70s who played piano, there was one song that you aspired to play anytime there was a piano in the room. You know what that is? What? Yes, The Entertainer. Um, the movie The Sting was out, and that had Robert Redford and, and Paul Newman, right? Both of those guys were in that movie, the reprising from uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And that movie was very popular, and in that movie was the song The Entertainer. My brother got the sheet music for that. My brother continued playing piano, um, still plays piano today, and I forget whether he ever was able to play that song. He may have been. Um, but I wasn't even close because I believed that one day I would sit down and it would just flow. I would literally just sit down at that piano bench and boom, it would come out. Have you ever seen Will Ferrell and his devil skit on SNL as the rock songwriter with Garth Brooks? You can look it up online. Garth Brooks, Will Ferrell, devil. You'll see what I'm talking about. Garth Brooks is sitting around on his couch thinking that a song will just come out, uh, just flow out of, his, out of his mind that will make him uh, a, a great music star and that'll launch him to uh, uh, great fame and money. Um, but I don't have that ability. But that doesn't matter too much. There's things, all th things that we don't have abilities that don't matter a whole lot. But one thing that does matter a whole lot is that I can swim, right? If you're ever out in a boat, it's an important thing that you're able to swim. Um, some things can be life and death abilities. 
Some abilities can mean the difference between us having a, 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 a prosperous life and a life that we enjoy and have satisfaction from and our lives being, being awful. Um, when we look at this passage, when we look at Palm Sunday and Jesus approaching Jerusalem, uh, what we see Jesus doing is something that we don't have the ability to do. And this was spoken of, and when Jesus approaches Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he's reliving 2 Samuel chapter 5. He's doing something for us as he approaches Jerusalem, and intentionally for us, that we could never do for ourselves. And so that's what we'll look at this morning. What is it that Jesus does, like David had done around 1000 BC, that we can't do for ourselves, like play the entertainer, right? So uh, as you, you, if you want to fill out blanks in an outline, uh, you are welcome to do that. If you want to just listen, that's fine uh, too. But what we're talking about this morning as we look at 2 Samuel 5 is the grand meaning of Palm Sunday. The grand meaning of Palm Sunday. What does that mean? How does God teach us about that? What was Jesus doing um, other than just giving us a day to uh, pass out palms after the, the service, my wife asked me yesterday. Have you always been in churches that pass out palms you know, after the service? And I said, you grew up Baptist. You don't believe in any ceremonies, so that's why you don't play. But she said, no, but you grew up in liberal churches. Is it just liberals that, that do that? And I said, I don't know. I said, I've always had that. So we get, we get palms. They're really nice ones this year um, that they gave us. Uh, but what does it mean? Uh, other than just giving us a time where we can feel religious because we went to a service where we walk out the door and get a, get a palm. Uh, first thing to realize this uh, uh, about this Palm Sunday is, is this. Number one, Jesus was God's chosen king. Jesus was God's chosen king, as David was. Now, uh, 1 Samuel 16 uh, God has become, uh, he's, he's dis, uh, uh, dissing uh, Saul. He's, he's replacing Saul as king because Saul was not an obedient king. Saul was a king who used the people for his own comfort. Uh, we see this with him sending out little David to fight Goliath instead of him going out. Even though Saul was a whole head taller than all the other Israelites, he was the guy. But he sends out David, a little boy. Uh, so God is replacing uh, Saul as king. We saw that in several references this morning. And, and he replaces him with David, a man after his own heart. And he does that in 1 Samuel 16. But uh, at first, the first seven years, and we see all, saw that in this passage, it's just David's brothers, the Judahites, the, those who are the tribe of Judah like David, who receive him as their king. And so there's this period of time, seven years in Israel, where David is king over Judah. Uh, but not yet. And Saul's family is still over the rest, the other 11 tribes. But then the 11 tribes get wise, and they all come, and we see it in this passage in 2 Samuel 5. Uh, they all get wise, and all the tribes, all Israel, you see that together, and you can see that emphasis here in this passage. All Israel, the tribes of Israel, came to David at Hebron, and Hebron was a city in Judah. And they said, we are your own flesh and blood. In the verse 2, in the past, while Saul was king over us, see, they're recognizing the foolishness of having somebody else than David be their king. When Saul was king over us, you alone were the, you were the one who led Israel on our, their military campaigns. See, Saul was safe in his palace. David let them out until Saul chased David out of the way. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. So all of Israel is recognizing this. David was God's chosen leader. Saul was the king, 1 Samuel 8, that the people wanted. He was a king like the nations. And God tells Samuel, tell the people, you don't want this. Warn them. He'll send out your, your, your sons in front of him in battle. He'll take your daughters and your sons to serve him in the palace and he'll tax you and he'll make things about him. And then you'll come crying to me and I won't hear you. Um, but, but, but David was the opposite. David was the king God chose. Like he said in Deuteronomy 17 to Moses and God's people through Moses, when you get into the land, put over you the king I choose. And this was David. 
And God shows this. Uh, uh, he demonstrates this. In, uh, uh, he demonstrates this in a demonstrable way. How about that? Um, and, and we looked at it last week or the week before in First, first Samuel 16. He goes. He sends Samuel to Bethlehem. And he doesn't tell him who he's going to have anoint king. He just says, "Go to Jesse's house." And then Samuel says, "Okay." And he, he sees the, the 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 best and the brightest and the strongest, the oldest son Eliab, and he says, "Surely, this is the Lord's anointed." And the Lord says, "No, do not anoint him. He's not the one." And he goes through these seven sons, and none of them are. And Samuel says, "The Lord has told me none of these are." Our king, and, and, and do you have any others? And so it's David who comes in from the fields, and Saul anoints him at the end of that chapter as king. Uh, so God very clearly says, this, David, is my choice, my choice for king. But the problem is then you have a reigning king in Saul, and you have an anointed king in David, and, and David won't bring an end to Saul's life because he respects the office of king. And so he has opportunity to do that. He doesn't do that. David is Saul's, or sorry, David is the Lord's choice for king. The Lord's choice for king. And Jesus is God's choice for king. This is why Jesus tells us that the good news is that the kingdom of God is here because he is God's choice for king. He is the son of David, a part of this an heir of this covenant that God makes with David in 2 Samuel 7 that you saw there, where God says to David, you and your sons will reign over my people forever, and I will give them peace through your sons reigning over them, ruling over them, your house. And so David comes as this son of David, and he's anointed as king by John the Baptist. Jesus didn't have to go for baptism because he was repenting of his sins. Jesus had no sins. Jesus, when he goes to John the Baptist, is being anointed as king. And God calls him there when Jesus is anointed as king, my son. He says, this is my son, John the Baptist hears it, with whom I am well pleased. The language of Jesus being God's son is the language of the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, where God said, David, you and your descendants will be, will be my sons, lowercase s. But Jesus is God's son, lowercase s and uppercase s. He's divine, eternal son of God who's always existed, but he's also human, son, anointed, descendant of David, whom God chooses to be king over his people. So Jesus is king. And second line there for you, and the church is his kingdom. Colossians 1.13 says this, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. This tells us that we, Paul writes to us in Colossians, or writes to the Colossians first and we listen in, that we have been brought into the kingdom. So we are all part of a kingdom. Philippians 3.20 says we're citizens of, that's kingdom language. We're a citizen of a kingdom, citizens of heaven. And Jesus is our king, having sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus said the good news was that the kingdom of God was at hand. And he knew he was about to be anointed, or he had been anointed as king, and he was about to ascend to his father's right hand to take charge over the kingdom of God's people. So the church is God's kingdom. You are kingdom members. The kingdom of God is not something in the future. The kingdom of God is something now. Paul says, Colossians 1.13, we have been brought in to the kingdom of the Son that the God the Father loves. Okay. Um, number two. Number two. Uh, Jesus enters as king. Now think about this. David becomes king over all Israel, and what's the first thing he does? He takes Jerusalem. Okay, so same thing. Number two, Jesus enters and captures God's chosen capital city, Jerusalem, as David had. That's what's going on on Palm Sunday. Okay, Jesus, anointed as king by John the Baptist, goes into Jerusalem to take the city. Um, we see this in verses 6 and 7 with David. Um, he goes in, and uh, it's a city that, that couldn't be captured, but, but he captures it. And the Jebusites, who were the people who lived in Jerusalem, 
They were non-Israelites. They were Canaanites, the Jebusites were. Uh, they say, there's no way you can take this city. Because Jerusalem was a city on a hill. Um, and so you guys will find that out, and you'll be there in, in a, a week or whenever it is. You know, there are hills on every side, east, 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 west, north, south. And on top of that hill in the city of Jerusalem, or Jebus, as it was called, were walls around the whole city. And so, as you've heard before, if you've been around the church a while, I mean, you could defend the city easily because people to, to take the city would be going up a hill, a steep hill. And to defend the city, you just stood on the top of the hill with a bunch of rocks and garbage and garbage pails and whatever you could find. And you just, you know, you just threw it down. Here's an old TV. You know, it's like David Letterman off the roof. You know, you just, you just threw it. If it didn't hit somebody directly, it would hit in front of them, and then it would knock out, you know, break their shins as they come up, came up there. And, and to, to, you know, shoot an arrow from, from that position, being, you know, having, having the high ground like uh, Obi-Wan, right? Um, don't try it, Anakin. I've got the high ground. And they had the high ground. And, and so uh, Jerusalem, so you see here, as all these passages that we talked about, um, Jerusalem is this city that God's people just, they, they couldn't conquer. Couldn't conquer. They couldn't conquer it in the day, days of uh, the uh, Joshua. They had conquered the Jebusites, but it was, it was about, uh, I don't know, 30 miles west of the city in another battle. But they didn't actually get the city. And then there's a time where they, they capture the city, but they don't have people to populate the city. And so the city just gets filled in again with Jebusites. Okay, so this was a city that remained, uh, remained unconquered, but David goes and he conquers, he conquers the city. And, 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 and likewise, uh, A, there in your outline, Jesus enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and we saw that in our call to worship this morning. He, he goes in, and what is proclaimed about Jesus? Look in the front of your bulletin there, the very first thing. What is proclaimed about who Jesus is as he enters Jerusalem? He's the king. Blessed is the king of Israel. Here comes the king, just like David. King over all the people, first verses in, in first, second Samuel 5. And then what's the king do? What's a good king of God's people do? He captures Jerusalem, God's choice for a capital city. And Jesus does this, and he's acknowledged as king coming into Jerusalem. He's traveled up the hill from the Mount of Olives. There's a mountain on the, on the uh, east side uh, there, and then there's a valley, and then it goes up to Jerusalem there. And so Jesus is here, and he comes, and, and, and he comes in, and, and he's uh, acclaimed as king. So he enters in, and what does Jesus do? B, as he's in Jerusalem, he overcomes death there in Jerusalem. He overcomes death. Now, David was threatened with death. He was attacking Jerusalem. And if you attack Jerusalem, you die. And the Jebusites joke, they said, you know, I mean, it's like our blame, or our blame, our lame and blind can fight against you and win. We can put people in wheelchairs up on the wall and they can hoist this stuff over. Hey, you got anything else? Got a watermelon? Poop. You know, put it over there. Okay, knock them out. Um, and so our blame and our, our lame and blind can defend this city. You will die. Don't even try it, David. But David overcomes death. He takes the city. He takes the city. Nobody else could do it. David does that. He takes the city. And that's what Jesus does, of course, in his resurrection, which we read about in Matthew 28. He goes into the city. He faces death. And he overcomes it, just like David had done. Goes into, to go into Jerusalem was a threatening thing. Jesus knew he was going to die when he went in there. And he goes in and he faces that threat of death, but death could not keep its hold on Jesus. And just as David survives victoriously in life with Jerusalem as his conquered city, uh, so, David had, so David had done before, before him. Beyond this, Jesus, in addition to going in and, and overcoming death, he rises to heaven. This is your C point. Beyond this, Jesus rises to heaven and captures the heavenly Jerusalem. 
Jesus conquers death in the earthly Jerusalem, but Jesus rises. Okay, if you have to, if you want to get to Jerusalem, you have to rise. It's a city on a hill. And Jesus rises in his ascension to the heavenly Jerusalem. And that's what we read about in Hebrews 12. You, if you're a Christian, the writer of Hebrews tells you, have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above. And that's what Jesus does. He, he not only conquers death in the earthly Jerusalem, but he rises to the heavenly Jerusalem to take, to take his seat there. So D, as with David and the earthly Jerusalem, no one else has had the ability to do this. That's what we talked about, and those are all those verses that Jim read for us this morning. Nobody had been able to, to conquer Jerusalem and inhabit it. it. It remained a city that was out of the Israelites' control even into the days of, uh, of David. They had been in the, in, in the promised land 400 years, over 400 years, and, and they hadn't conquered they hadn't conquered Jerusalem. Nobody could do it. Nobody could conquer the city and inhabit it and chase out the Jebusites, but, but David does. He, does. he plays the entertainer. Okay? He does the thing that nobody had the ability, that nobody had the ability to do. How does he, how does he do it? Well, see Romans 6.23, you've got listed there. The wages of sin is death. We by ourselves try to get into the heavenly Jerusalem on our own. And in our own ability, we die. We attack Jerusalem. We try to take Jerusalem. We try to take Jerusalem above on our own, and we die. We can't do that. Saul couldn't do it. The people during the days of the judges couldn't do it. The people under Joshua couldn't do it. In ourselves, we have sin. And sin results in us, for us, death. Not victory. When we die and try to approach the heavenly Jerusalem, but death, eternal death. Uh, that's Romans 6.23. But the good news is, 1 Peter 2.22, Jesus committed no sin. So Jesus doesn't come to the heavenly Jerusalem and get shut out and face eternal death or the second death. Jesus instead has no sin, and so he has no sin to pay for, that's his own. And so he conquers. He conquers the city. He conquers the city. Um, Jesus put it this way as he talked about his own lack of sin and, and his victory over death in John 16, 10 through uh, 12 there. He talks about when he, come, when he ascends up to heaven, the Holy Spirit would come and he would convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And he says that, you know, of sin because the world has rejected me. But of righteousness, here's what the Holy Spirit would convince people of, that Jesus is righteous. And he says, of righteousness because I go to the Father. Jesus said, I will die, but I will rise to the heavenly Jerusalem. I will go to the Father, and going to the Father will prove the fact that I have not sinned. And so Jesus can do the thing that none of us can do in and of ourselves. We can't get to heaven apart from Jesus. We need Jesus as our king to take Jerusalem, don't we? We're just like those Israelites during David's day. Nobody else, nobody else could conquer Jerusalem until David came along and said, let's go. I don't care what they say up there. Let's go. Let's fight. And they go and they fight and they take Jerusalem. And he takes up residence there. And that's a picture for us of what salvation is like today for us for our souls, and when we die. Nobody can attain, nobody deserves heaven. Nobody can die and be there with God because they have sinned, but Jesus has no sin. He commits no sin, no deceit found in his mouth, and he takes Jerusalem. And so we just follow David, the son of David, Jesus. We follow him up there. We say, you know what? This was a good decision I made to make Jesus my king. 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5, those first verses there. That was a good decision because my king conquers the heavenly Jerusalem. My king, Jesus, conquers death. My king takes up residence in heaven. And guess what? I get to be, you know, there with him. 
Okay. E, in your outline there, Jesus was established as king in heaven, the Jerusalem above. Um, and he resides there as David did in the Jerusalem below. Um, verse 12 there, uh, the Lord has had established David as king over Israel. Um, verse 9, verse 9 there, David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. Um, and so Jesus goes up to what Galatians 4.26 calls the Jerusalem above. Um, we read about in Revelation 5 that when Jesus uh, ascends, he ascends up to heaven and he sits down at the right hand of God, as Hebrews 1.3 also tells us. He takes up residence there in heaven. So that's where Jesus is now. He's taken, he's conquered the heavenly Jerusalem. He's gone up there and he resides there as David resided in Jerusalem uh, for the rest of his life after conquering uh, this city. Um, Psalm 2.6 puts it this way. God the Father says, I have installed my king on my holy hill on Zion. Now David David wrote this in Psalm 2, and he's talking about himself first. God had installed his king. God had installed his king, David, on Zion, which is Zion means Jerusalem, on this holy hill. Jerusalem was a hill. And so God, God was taking care of his people by providing for them a king, David, that was installed as king in Jerusalem. Okay. Um, now, um, onward, number three, number three. Jesus went to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, knowing he was going to his death, but also back to heaven for you and for his church. This is the difference between David and Saul. Saul does things for himself. Saul does things to protect himself. Jesus gives himself in reckless abandon for his people, even if it means his death. Right? That's right, as on the cross. That's the way God's kings were to operate, to give themselves over for the sake of their people. And so Jesus goes to Jerusalem, and when you think of Palm Sunday, think, Jesus was going into that city for me, and for all my brothers and sisters in Christ. He wasn't going in there with any illusion in his head that the Pharisees would receive him. He knew, and he had told his disciples time and time again before going to Jerusalem that he was going to die there. And so at the end of John, at the end of John 11, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, Jesus says, now let's go to Jerusalem. And good old Thomas says, okay, let's go there that we may die too with him. <laughs> Thomas was the Eeyore of the disciples. Um, okay, let's go there to Jerusalem and die there with him. Thomas understood. Jesus had been talking about, when we go to Jerusalem, I'll be handed over by the chief priests, the Pharisees. I'll be handed over to the Romans. I'll be scourged, and I will die. But on the third day, I'll rise again. So Jesus goes in um, for the sake of his people, Israel. Uh, David takes Jerusalem for the sake of God's people, Israel, too just as Jesus goes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday for the sake of his people, the church. Now, how? That's your blank there. How is Jesus taking both Jerusalems for your benefit? How is Jesus taking both Jerusalems, the earthly Jerusalem, through his overcoming death, and the heavenly Jerusalem through his ascension and seating at the right hand of God? How is that for your, how is that for your benefit? A, first thing. Jesus entering earthly Jerusalem on Palm Sunday made the acceptable sacrifice for your sins a reality. A reality. Um, number one there. In David's day, fully acceptable worship and sacrifices, um, because he took Jerusalem, fully acceptable sacrifices could now be offered. Could now be offered because David had taken Jerusalem as the tabernacle was relocated to Jerusalem uh, as, David took, as David took that city. And the reason that now acceptable sacrifices, fully acceptable sacrifices could be offered was because Jerusalem was the only, those are your blanks, Jerusalem was the only place such offerings were to be offered. So Jesus, uh, uh, David takes uh, uh, Jerusalem, he resides in the city, the tabernacle's relocated there, but you see what Jim read for us in Deuteronomy 12, that fairly long passage where God says to Moses when they're still out um, east of the promised land, 
uh, when they're still used to the promised land, he said, when you get in the promised land, don't offer sacrifices anywhere. Don't have sacrifices being offered to me over in Gad or, or, or up in Zebulun or, or down in Simeon or over in Daniel. No, those aren't acceptable. In fact, take all the high places, and a high place in the Old Testament was a pagan worship site where there's some kind of hill and people would, pagan people would build an altar and they would offer sacrifices to pagan gods. And God says, wipe out their altars, wipe out their high places. There's only one place for you to come and offer sacrifices. And that's what Deuteronomy 12 is about. And it's the place where I will put my name or my presence and you're, you're to come there. But don't offer sacrifices other places. Just the place I will show you. And so we, we find out uh, from uh, the, um, the days of Solomon and as David takes Jerusalem at this, this is the place. Uh, so Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday made, made the acceptable sacrifice for your sins a reality. Um, so Jerusalem was that only place. And then number two, um, a once for all sin sacrifice needed to be offered in earthly Jerusalem um, in Jesus' day. Um, days after Palm Sunday, days after Palm Sunday, uh, on that Friday that we call Good Friday now, um, that once for all your sins sacrifice was made, and where does an acceptable sacrifice need to be made? In Jerusalem. So Jesus goes into Jerusalem as king, like David, but he also, like David, established the place for acceptable sacrifices to be offered, Jesus does this too. He enters in Jerusalem as king and he gives this acceptable sacrifice as high priest and as the sacrifice itself. So the days after Palm Sunday, the once for all sins sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus, that's your blank, was offered in Jerusalem. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10.10, 10, speaking of this sacrifice Jesus made of his own body in Jerusalem, he says this, We, God's people, have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So God's people didn't have the acceptable place to make a sacrifice until David came into Jerusalem and took the city. And until Jer Jesus comes into Jerusalem there on Palm Sunday, that acceptable sacrifice to cover our transgressions for the forgiveness of our sins doesn't happen. So thus, number three, from Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, your sins are forgiven. So Palm Sunday means not only is the king taking the city, but now since the city is taken, that the acceptable sacrifice for your forgiveness has been offered. B, second benefit for you. Um, first benefit is that now you have forgiveness for your sins. Second benefit, Jesus entering both Jerusalems means God's presence is with you. God's presence is with you always. And joy, too, in your life now. So God's presence, because Jesus goes into Jerusalem, the result of that is you have God's presence with you. And because of God's presence with you, you have joy. So number one there, God told Moses that his presence would be with his people in Jerusalem to make them joyful. And that's in Deuteronomy 12, both verses 7 and 12. Jesus says, bring your sacrifices there, come to Jerusalem, and in this place you will rejoice. You'll rejoice as you come together and are before my presence. God mentions this specifically in Deuteronomy 12. My presence will be there. You'll come before me and you will have joy. So number two, the presence of God was experienced by God's people after David conquered Jerusalem and his son built the temple there. So David gathers all the stuff for temple building, but he's told he couldn't build the temple, but he gathers all the stuff, all the materials for it. And so when Solomon takes the throne, Solomon gives the orders, and the temple is built. And God's people can come in joyful assembly in the presence of the Lord, and God was especially present there in his temple, um, present there in the temple, and the people could have joy. 
Um, 1 Kings 8, 62 through 66 is where Solomon dedicates the temple. And the people come there and they have joy. So three, three. Upon Jesus reaching the Jerusalem above, um, how's, how's the presence of God get to this, get to us? Jesus reaches the, the Jerusalem above, and what he does is he sent his spirit. He sent his spirit to make his presence indwell you. He sent his spirit to make his presence indwell you, making you his temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Okay? You're a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, whom you have from God. So because Jesus goes into Jerusalem, because Jesus conquers that city, because Jesus then conquers death and goes up and takes his throne in the Jerusalem above, you have the presence of God with you. Because he sent, when he ascended on high, he sent his spirit. We saw that in Acts chapter 2. He sends his spirit. And his spirit is given to everybody who's his. And so we are called temples of the Holy Spirit. We are people who have God's presence in us. Just like in David's day, the presence of God was in his temple there. Now, the good news about that is the presence of God by his Holy Spirit in us gives us joy. And that's your next blank there. It gives us joy. Uh, and and uh, so, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and those other things. But Jesus goes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday that he might rise to the heavenly Jerusalem and send you his spirit, his very presence, to give you joy, that that would be a fruit of God's presence in your life by his spirit. So that's good news. Jesus entering both Jerusalems means that God's presence is with you always. And joy, too, even in the midst of horrible circumstances, can be in your life. And C, third benefit of Jesus uh, going into Jerusalem and taking it. Uh, Jesus successfully ascending to the heavenly Jerusalem to dwell there means that you get to dwell there too when you die. Okay. It means you get to dwell there too when you die. The Israelites had conquered Jerusalem and the Jebusites before, but not completely, and the Jebusites continued to indwell there. No Israelite was in, dwelling in Jerusalem. No Israelite was there in the presence of God before his temple until David enters Jerusalem. Uh, David made inhabiting, that's your blank there, A, David made inhabiting Jerusalem a reality for God's people. Number two, Jesus didn't conquer the enemy Jebusites, but your greater enemy, death, that references uh, John 11, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. He believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. So Jesus conquers our enemy, not the Jebusites, but death itself. He gives us, he gives us life, but then that life is not just spiritual life that we have here on this earth, but number three, his going to the heavenly Jerusalem is also his going to prepare a place for you. And Jim read about that for us in John 14. Jesus says, hey, I'm not only, you know, I've not only arrived here, he's speaking in the earthly Jerusalem when he gave these words in John 14. I've not only arrived here, but I'm going away from you. But I'm going to heaven, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. It's like you're out in Bethlehem, which wasn't too far from Jerusalem. And you know David and his troops are going to travel in front of you, and you're hoping that they conquer Jerusalem. And then they do. And David's there, and David yeah, establishes his throne there and sits down and the temple goes there, and so God's prayer, the tabernacle goes there, and God's presence is there, and so you have the human king of God's people next to the throne of God, which was the Ark of the Cherubim, and God's presence there, and there's an invitation. Hey, anyone who wants to come live in Jerusalem can. And that's the gospel, isn't it? Anyone who wants to come and live in the heavenly Jerusalem, anyone who wants to be in heaven when they die can. But you know what? David's got to be your king. The son of David has to be your king. Jesus, that's the gospel. The son of David has conquered heaven. 
going to dwell there? Be his subject. Be his citizen. And you can dwell there forever. Well, at least until he comes back again and establishes new hands near earth. But that's our little footnote there. So that's good news, isn't it? Because Jesus conquered, because he rose up, because his throne was established by the Father, like David's throne was established by the Father in the earthly Jerusalem, because his throne is established by the Father there in heaven, we have assurance, we know this is the place where we will dwell when we die. So that's good news. Jesus has gone. See, that? See those words in John 14? That's David before he attacks Jerusalem. Isn't it? Tell, he can tell his brothers, hey, I'm going to prepare a place for you. We're attacking Jerusalem. If you're going to live there after we conquer it, you can come. Jesus says to us, I've gone to prepare a place for you. So, summary. Um, Palm Sunday, uh, the conquering of Jerusalem by David, uh, which prefigures what Jesus did on Palm Sunday by going to the Jerusalem below and then to the Jerusalem above is this. Rejoice. Rejoice at Jesus' journey into Jerusalem. When you think about Palm Sunday, when you think about palms, rejoice at this because of what it means Jesus was committed to doing for you. Rejoice at Jesus' journey into Jerusalem. It was his going to battle. This is what Jesus was doing. He was the new and better and ultimate David going to do battle, not with the Jebusites, but with death. And not to conquer just earthly Jerusalem, but to conquer the heavenly Jerusalem for you. And so it was him going to battle to obtain for you forgiveness, which happens when he makes that acceptable sacrifice there in Jerusalem, which could happen after David took the earthly Jerusalem, to obtain for you forgiveness, for, to obtain for you God's presence in your life. When Jesus takes the heavenly Jerusalem, he sends to you in time his spirit, in your life, to give you eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand and a spirit to lead you and give you power to follow God's word in your life. So it gives presence in you, his presence in you uh, after he's gone to the heavenly Jerusalem and he gives you joy from that. Because we have God's spirit, because we know he's our father, we have joy even in the midst of the tribulation that we endure today. And from that, from that, we have inhabitants in heaven. He gives you inhabitants in heaven for you. That's the good news of Palm Sunday. You can overcome death because he has overcome death. He's got your enemy out of the way. He conquered death for you. He conquered the Jebusites for you. And he has established a place for you in heaven where God's presence will be with you forever and he's given you his presence now by his Holy Spirit. Let's pray.